Hi, I'm Dr. Jason Fung. Today what we're going to share is my top three tips for intermittent fasting because there's a lot of people that want to try intermittent fasting and there's a few tips that we learned along the way that might be able to help you. First, we're going to talk about Marina. In 2018, she was already diagnosed with breast cancer and fatty liver disease and she said she was just waiting to get diagnosed with diabetes as well. She knew it was coming. So, desperate, she tried lots of things. She tried eating six small meals a day. Didn't work. She tried joining a gym. Didn't really help. Finally, she learned about intermittent fasting and thought she would give it a go. So, she read my book, The Complete Guide to Fasting, and started to try it. At first, it was tough. So she joined the fastingmethod.com to learn more about it and also develop some friends who she might be able to do this with. And she was able to lose over 50 pounds and reverse much of her disease. We're going to share some tips that allowed her to do that and also her fasting regimen at the end of this video. So let's get right to it. So here's tip number three. Make sure that you stay hydrated. So remember, when you're fasting, you're not eating, but you can still drink water. A classic fast is water only. And water is great. A lot of people do very well with that. It makes it a lot easier if you're staying hydrated because some of the hunger tends to go down. But there's a few other things that you can drink other than water that might be very uh, helpful to include. The first one I would like to talk about is green tea. Green tea might be especially useful for weight loss for a number of different reasons. And what's the difference? Well, green tea is brewed from the unfermented uh, tea leaves. And these contain certain antioxidants, most important of which are called catechins, uh, also called ECGC is the specific one. And the reason that they're so beneficial is that they may have a role in suppressing hunger, but also increasing the metabolic rate. And those two things are going to make it easier to lose weight and to fast. And some of the studies that have been done in the scientific literature really bear this out. We can look at a certain meta-analysis, which are studies which group other studies together to look at the overall effect. And you can see when they look at this that drinking green tea seems to lead to an extra 1.5 to 2 kilograms of weight loss. Well, that's a real benefit and green tea is cheap, it's available, it's been used for thousands of years and it's also very tasty. So there's no reason not to use it. The other thing that green tea tends to do is increase the metabolic rate and this may be due to not only the catechins, but also some of the caffeine that's in green tea may increase the sympathetic nervous system and lead your body to use more calories. So in this meta-analysis, what they find is that perhaps about three to 400 extra calories per day is used extra when you're taking this green tea. So again, the caffeine and the catechins will tend to make your body sort of a little bit more active and therefore it needs more energy and therefore it burns more calories. The green tea, through these various mechanisms, may increase the amount of fat oxidation as well as carbohydrate oxidation, which means that your body is using up some of the glucose and using up some of the fat. Remember that the catechins are thought to be the main mechanism through which this happens. If you drink regular hot brewed green tea, you're going to get a good amount of catechins, more than any other type of tea or any other type of beverage, but we can do even better than that. If you use a special cold brew, then you can actually extract more of the catechins because just like when you use cold brew coffee, you can get more of the flavor. When you use the cold brew for green tea, you can also get more of the catechins out because the heat of the water can sometimes destroy them. But it's not just green tea. If you don't like green tea, that's fine. You can also drink black teas and oolong teas. So the difference between black teas and green teas is that the black teas are fermented. Oolong is a sort of semi-fermentation. 
So you don't get as many of the catechins, but these catechins actually get changed into other antioxidants called theoflavins, and they may also have some of the same benefits, such as this study where it showed that it also increased the amount of energy expenditure. The other uh, beverages to stay hydrated and also help you with the fasting might be something such as coffee. Now coffee, of course, can be taken black, but be careful about what you add to it. If you're just adding a small amount of cream, that's likely okay, but adding too much sweeteners or sugar or uh, other dairy products is gonna add calories and work against you for weight loss. It's the same for bone broth. So bone broth is another beverage that can be very effective to get you through your fasting day. Uh, however, just remember that it does have calories, it does have some protein and so on, but again, if it allows you to go longer, easier, it might be worth it in the end. So all of these fasting variations are very useful. Uh, the other thing to consider is also herbal teas. So these are not true teas because they don't contain tea leaves, but things like mint, for example, can be very calming. Chamomile, uh, for example, at nighttime is very soothing. Lemon, that kind of thing. So here's tip number two. Remember to ride the hunger waves. What I mean is that when you fast, you have to understand that you are going to get hungry. That's just natural. So you have to know how to deal with it because the number one worry about fasting is that people think that they're gonna get hungry and then they're gonna get more and more and more hungry if they don't eat until they're completely consumed by the hunger and they can't do anything else. Luckily, that's not true. So you have to prepare for it. So if we look at the hunger hormone ghrelin, we can see what happens during fasting. In this study, they took people and fasted them for 24 hours to see what would happen to their ghrelin levels, which will correlate to their hunger levels over 24 hours of not eating. And what you see is that during breakfast or lunch or dinner, if you don't eat, your hunger does not keep going up. It actually peaks and then falls just like a wave. And if you look at lunch, for example, if you eat lunch normally at 12 o'clock, at 1 o'clock, 1.30, you're going to be hungry. But by 4 o'clock, in fact, you are no more hungry than if you ate because your ghrelin levels are back to baseline. Because your body took the calories that it needed out of your body fat. So you're essentially feeding your body off of your body fat. So that's why you're not hungry anymore. So it comes as a wave. If you know that, you can simply do something, maybe drink a big cup of green tea, for example, and by the time you finish it, the hunger wave will have passed and you can get on with your day. What if you do multiple days of fasting? Does the hunger just keep going up and up and up? Actually, it does quite the opposite. What you see is that over day one, your ghrelin goes up very high and then starts to come down. On day two, it goes up again, but not quite as high. So over multiple days of fasting, what happens is that the hunger actually slowly disappears, which is the reason that people have been able to do these long fasts. Uh, you know, in the 60s and 70s, people would go 30 days, 60 days. The world record was 380 days. People said, how can you do that? It's like because the hunger had largely disappeared. And you can use that to your advantage if you decide to do a long fast. Is there a difference between men and women? Well, if you look at the studies, it suggests that both men and women have this same effect. So both of the ghrelins go up when you don't eat and both of them will show a slow decline over time. So we would expect this effect to be the same in both men and women. The other real benefit in terms of fasting is the effect on cravings. So cravings are things that we really feel like eating. So people really crave ice cream or they crave sweets or any of those things. When you don't eat, it appears that the cravings significantly go down. So in this study, what they did is they compared a low calorie diet, which is a sort of standard 1200 calorie a day diet, 
compared to an extremely low calorie diet, which is less than 500, which some people would consider on par with fasting. And you can see that the low calorie diet didn't really do much in terms of reducing cravings, but if you look at the very low calorie diets, you can see that the cravings virtually disappeared. So this will be no surprise to parents. Uh, if you have a child who is itchy, the last thing you want to do is scratch it. And it's the same with cravings. If you have a craving and you feed that craving, you're, it's not going to go away. It's just going to get worse. The only way to get rid of those cravings is to not feed it at all. And then over time, those cravings will disappear. Even after you start eating them again, what the studies show is that the cravings still remain at a much lower level than before. And this is another benefit of the fasting is that it's going to reduce the cravings and therefore reduce not just the hunger, but some of the psychological drives that are leading you to eat these things that we know are not good for us, the sweets, the desserts, those types of foods. So here's the number one tip for fasting. Stay busy. So if you're not eating, you're gonna have a little bit more time. But there's a few things that you should do and a few things that you shouldn't do. So here's the things that you should not do when you're fasting. Go on social media. On social media, you're gonna see lots of people talking about what they ate, what they are want to eat, you know, you're going to see ads for uh, food and so on, and it's going to make it a lot harder for you to fast. On the same lines, grocery shopping is not a good idea because you're surrounded by food. Cooking is definitely going to make you hungry. So again, that's just going to make it difficult for you to do your fast. So what can you do if you're the one who cooks? Because a lot of us, for example, have kids that we cook for. Well, there's a few strategies, but you have to plan a little bit ahead. For example, what you could do is cook ahead of time, and then they can simply uh, reheat that. To, or, for example, you could ask them, uh, you know, you're either your spouse or your kids or your parents, whoever you're cooking for, maybe to go out for that meal, or maybe take it somewhere else. So you could send your kids, for example, to their grandparents for uh, that meal, and that won't make you tempted. Because the sights and the sounds of people eating, that's going to stimulate you to want to eat as well, and that's going to make it tough for you to fast. If you uh, are asking a family member to cook, for example, then you can simply get out of the house for a little while. So a few other things that you should keep in mind is that Going to a mall is probably not a good idea because again, you've got smells all around you from the food court. That's what a lot of uh, people rely on to get you in to buy their food. Cinnabon, for example, was famous for wafting the smell all over the mall and then making everybody want to buy their foods. Seeing a movie in the movie theater, for example, is the same. There's a the smell of popcorn, you see people eating and so on. And parties are much the same idea because a lot of parties are going to have food and people are going to want to socialize and socialization and the food often go together. So what can you do when you're fasting? Well, here's some suggestions. You can take a bath, very relaxing. You can add some bubbles to it, you can add some scents to it, maybe light some candles. You could listen to some music. You could call your mom, call your dad, call your kids. A conversation is going to take your mind completely off of it. Maybe you could organize your closet, you could organize your shoes, you could organize your jewelry, you could clean up your room, you could clean up the basement, <laughs> you know. There's a lot of stuff down there that gets uh, piled up over the years. Uh, you could dust the baseboards, you could clean, you could go out, you could get a haircut, try a new hairstyle. Maybe you could look online for some vacation ideas. You can go swimming. You could go for a walk outside. If it's cold, maybe you can go snowshoeing or you can go cross-country skiing. You could go to the lake, you could take a drive, you could walk your dog, you could read a book, try some Zumba, try a class, take your bicycle if you haven't done that for a while, maybe go out to a field, take some pictures, 
pick some flowers, do some gardening, call a friend, go to the library, and how about this, watch some YouTube videos. All of these things are great ways to get your mind off of eating. It's especially easy at work because there's always more work to be done. You could schedule a meeting at work, you could go through your emails. Uh, this is what I usually do in fact. When I have these podcasts to do or somebody wants to do an interview, I schedule it at lunchtime and then I simply don't eat. And by the time I finish talking to somebody, then it's time to do the next thing or go to the next meeting. I've completely forgotten about it. The hunger has settled down because you're so focused on doing something else. And guess what? You just made it easy for yourself to fast and to lose weight and get work done at the same time. Maybe even go home a little bit early. So all of these things you got to keep in mind, plan ahead. These are great tips to help you lose weight for the new year. And what was Marina's schedule? Marina used a lot of 24 hours a day fasting, which is also called a one meal a day. So in a one meal a day schedule, people will, for example, eat breakfast and not eat again until the next day's breakfast or more typically uh, eat dinner and then not eat again until dinner time. And the reason that dinner tends to work the best is that it's the meal that is the most social, that is you often take it with friends or with family, whereas it's very easy to skip breakfast and lunch. Some people ask, well, is there a difference? I think for weight loss, truthfully, it would be better to skip the dinner, take your uh, meal earlier in the day rather than later. But again, you have to balance the realities of life with the sort of uh, benefits uh, to the fasting. So it's really hard sometimes to skip the dinner. Thanks for watching. I'm going to do a short survey and leave a comment below to say which tip helped you the most and what sort of things did you do during fasting that might help you or maybe help some others. Let me know. And remember, if you like this video, make sure to subscribe, hit the like button, and turn on the bell for notifications. Bye, everybody.